trying to get their attention and you don't need that. So there we go. Now, is this turned on? Look at it, would you? Yeah. yeah, I think he turned it. You turned that on, didn't you? You turned it on, didn't you? It's on. You was expecting Clyde Gable? <laughs> Those lights on me, man. Our Father in Jesus' blessed name, we would come to thee, ask your blessed spirit to come to our side and help us to shut out all truant thoughts and think on this wonderful word. But we're sad when we see how it's been abused and misused. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to bless these people so that they might be a blessing to a sin-sick, dying world Turn them from sin unto intelligence and in cheerful submission to Christ. Spirit of God, bless them, I pray, and I thank you now in Christ's name. Amen. amen. Would you please turn your Bibles to, to Ephesians? Uh, don't tell me this is to Christians. The whole book is to Christians. But it's, really, this book is just a plain to people. He didn't write it for monkeys. Everybody in this room perhaps can quote these couple of verses. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, it is the gift of God, and I think the gift is he gives himself. Amen. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I believe this word is perhaps the most misused word in the Bible. And we all know there's a lot of words in here that's misused. And we've done it. And I say we includes me. Now, <clears throat> half of you weren't here last year. And I'm going to back up and cover a little bit of what I did then. Now, by this word grace, there's quite a background. I've got to lay down here. And as Brother Gordon would say, a panorama of truth before we can get into this. <clears throat> there are 400 promises of God in the Bible for man, but only one of them that doesn't have conditions connected to the promise, only one. And he also says one thing in Psalms, that gives conditions to the, to the 399. Now, the only promise God has made, there is no condition connected to it. He says, I will never cover the earth with water again. Makes a plain promissory statement there. But if the other 399, he says to you and to me, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he'll not hear me. But that is not the only one that there are connections or conditions to having them answered. Now, I think we all agree, the men here and women, that have studied the atonement in a serious way, and I thank God for every one of you to have, is still the greatest subject in all the world, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried rose again, was seen among men. To me, that's a gospel. Now, I think you agree with me and Brother Gordon and Finney that God can never have a method of forgiving sin that's going to hurt the sinner. Right. Now, Brother Dean Harvey tells about when he got straightened out on the atonement, he taught it to his people down the church in 
<clears throat> Virginia. And one of those nights, he said to them, you correct me, Brother Dean, if I don't have this correct, because you've got you to gotta, you gotta follow me pretty close. I do a lot of lecturing on mathematics, and I always start out by telling them, listen, I, I didn't get 90% of the mathematical principles right when I went to school, but I know the other 5% doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> So I'm about as infallible as the Pope. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. But Dean said, he asked these people, now that you know the truth on the atonement, how many of you can look back to when you believed the payment theory and you were tempted and you said, well, I'm going to go ahead and do it because it's paid for anyway. I think every person in this room could say yes or that. Only 18 of those people got real honest, I think. We don't like to admit to things like that. But I think that's true. That is a way that it hurts a sinner, no doubt about it, in my book. And as he was saying, if he paid, he's not freely forgiving by his grace. Because what he's paid for is paid for, but isn't forgiven. Because many a man, is, when he heard that payment theory, he has said, well, I see, God's like I am. I'll forgive you when you pay me back. Well, if he's paid back, he doesn't need forgiveness. Besides, it makes a scrooge and a tyrant out of our great God. That's the worst thing about it is, what it does to God. And I was just saying to our dear brother here, he's coming with us. Finnis Dake one time said to me, in a conference out in uh, Denver. He said, Brother Khan, I know 1,215 misconceptions that preachers preach about God. It's a wonder anybody loves him. I, 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 I believed like that before I knew Finnis or ever met him. Now, he will not come up with a way to forgive sin it's going to hurt the sinner. Ah, but how about the word grace? You think he has come up with a word here that'll hurt the sinner? If properly understood? Of course not. Now you've got to look at a word, word within its context. Now I've said before to some of you, I was with my wife over in Scotland. Most of you know I'm a Scottish distraction. Well, my dad really was Scottish. He was so Scottish he wouldn't wear rubber sole shoes because they give. <laughs> in fact, one time a fellow saw him coming out of the bank in my hometown, which is only 45 miles from here. There's no sign saying down there it's my hometown, but it is. <laughs> And this other Scotsman said, hello, Scotty, me boy, putting some more in? My dad said, no. Well, Scotty, me boy, you taking some out? Nope. Then what are you doing in there? He said, just filling me fountain pen. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I saw these men bowling on the village green in Glasgow. The the village green. And there was a woman there with a green dress on. And I knew several women in Rockford that were green with envy. And I saw a young baseball player with a lot of natural ability, but he was green as grass. He didn't even know enough when he's on third base to stand on the foul side of the line. Because <laughs> if you get hit, then you're not out. There's all kinds of things here, ballplayers. You look at the green, most of them are green and grass. In fact, I can't stand to go see a high school basketball game. It's like Finney and his music. Most of those choirs were, he said, were very painful to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> well, every time I used the word green, I put it in a different context, didn't I? And it had a different meaning. 
So if you're going to know what grace means, you've got to know the context, because if you don't look at a text within a context, you come up with a pretext. Now, I have found, not just me, but 13 meanings of the word grace. 13. And furthermore, five of the writers to the epistles, they, he start, they start out like this. Grace and peace to you, my brethren. You don't think they're saying unmerited favor and peace to you, my brethren, do you? Of course not. Of course not. Well, most of us don't seem to know that this word grace is, was transliterated, not translated. Now, we've been messed up in the Bible many places by those men who transliterated things without translating. Let me give you an example. I was a Baptist many years in my young life, just like I was a Democrat before I learned how to read. <laughs> so, <laughs> He told me a good one in the president. I ain't gonna tell. <laughs> oh, by the way, the president's wife, you know why she wears those? Those turtleneck sweaters when he's speaking? You watch always. Well, when he's speaking, she he doesn't want people to see her Adam's apple going up and down. <laughs> So just to keep from wondering, I'm going to start reading here, and there'll be no more of my terrific jokes. <laughs> the word charis is found many times at grace in English version of the Bible. And as I was saying to you about baptism, now, when they came to that word baptizo, they just took it over here in English and called it baptism without telling us what it meant. In the Greek, and then you read Greek mythology, you will find that the Greek navy was baptizo. That means sunken, <laughs> submerged into, fused together. Christ said, I and you, and you and me. Isn't that right? Yeah. I submerged into, fused together. Now look at all the different brands of baptism that you got today because. They transliterated that without translating. That's my point. And every time they do that, we get in trouble. And we usually pick out one which fits our flesh. Our flesh. Now, Dr. James R. Graham taught me many, many decades ago to interpret the scriptures and the light of your flesh is wrong. Because it's not the way the scriptures to make it easy on the flesh. When I say flesh, I mean the lower nature of man, and I mean to gratify the five senses. And such as, one of those five senses is seen. Now, if you're a Christian, all you want to do the rest of your life is go around the world on these luxury cruises and see all these beautiful fjords and all these kind of things. Well, you're no different than a drunk in the gutter. The only difference is he, you got a higher cultural level of sin than that poor drunk in the gutter has. Your heart's the same. Uh, some of these things are pretty serious, aren't they? How could we spend our money like that with all the poor in the world and with over 5,000 tribes and tongues and nations that have yet to hear the gospel and he's not coming back until he does? They do. Because thou hast redeemed us, our God, by thy blood of every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation and people. To ever say, Jesus may come any back... Back any moment is 24 karen ignoramus. Amen. Didn't he say, And this gospel of the world shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come? I, one time I was speaking at a missionary conference in uh, Minneapolis, and this pastor, I was to meet him the next day for lunch, and he got there a half hour late. And I sat in the lobby of the old Nicolette and just read my Bible and read the 24th chapter of Matthew again. He come in, well, 
He says, Brother Khan, Brother Khan, I'm sorry I'm late, but isn't time short? Time is short. Time is short, isn't it? I said, no. No. I'm not an evangelical stamp, if you know what I mean. He said, what do you mean? I said, if you're going to say that in reference to the poor man in the jungle that hadn't heard the gospel today, yes, time is short. Or the man that's on his bed of affliction doesn't know the Lord, time is short. But he's told us what to do, and he's coming back for his bride, and there isn't a man this woman that married a half a woman. Is that right? Or did you marry half a woman? <laughs> and I said to him, do you know while, I say, while I've been waiting for you, I read the 24th chapter of Matthew over, and I counted nine signs that haven't been fulfilled. And Billy Graham will still say, all the signs have been fulfilled. What in the world is he reading? A series of robot catalog? And yet people let these guys get away with that. And that kind of stuff. And then they wonder why the church is in such a mess. All right, now, if we're going to look at a word, I say we must look at the context in which it's used. So, the word is found 155 times in the New Testament. And Paul was the one who used a hundred of them. Now, Brother Gordon used to say, speaking now of, of Acts 20, that Jesus there said, Now repentance is unto remission of sins is now to be preached. And he said that was a great grace preacher. <laughs> the great grace preacher. Repentance unto remission of sins be preached in all nations. Is that right? Well, that doesn't sound like the grace preachers I know. So, many people are under the mistaken notion that the word charis means unmerited favor in each and every context in which it is found. I like the first round before I go much further, give you a strong definition of saving grace. I admit Strong is a Calvinist, but some of those guys know something too. <laughs> I'm not going to brag on them, but Strong's definition of saving grace is the divine influence of God upon the heart and a reflection in the life. See, that's not to go out and do as you please. Just like Christian liberty is not to go out and do as you please. It's the ability of the Spirit of God that helps you through the grace of God to go out and do what you ought to do. Yeah. You know the word ought has been so misused in our country and England. It no longer means what the Bible means. The word for it is D-E-I in the Bible. It's used 108 times in the New Testament. I'm going to quote you in two verses here. One from 1 John. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked. The word therefore ought is day, D-I. But that's also in John 3 when Jesus said ye must be born again. Well, is that optional? Well, how about walking as he walked? Is that optional? No. See, evangelicalism is being strangled with optional discipleship. With optional discipleship. And what they've done with this word grace is just feathered their own nest with it. An important point to remember about this word is that the English word grace is not a translation of the Greek word charis. It is a transliteration. That is, an equivalent sounding English letter has been substituted for the equivalent sounding Greek letter producing somewhat similar sounding Greek and English words. Now, by the way, I've got another half of the, this paragraph, but I wanted to say this. I mean, this is going to come out as a book, about a five-chapter book. And I'm going to have a whole thing in there on this matter of transliteration and how they, work, how they mess it up by transliteration. You never know what any word in this world means apart from a context in which it's used. It's the context that gives a word meaning. Like I said about the word green, and there's 
thousands of words just like that. Let me read this sentence again. It is a transliteration. That is, the equivalent sounding in English letter produces somewhat similar sounding in English words. A similar example is English word deacon for diakonos. The meaning of diakonos in the New Testament is simply a servant. Christ and Paul both identified themselves by this word. Therefore, the meaning of charis, when transliterated as grace, must be determined in each and individual context in which it's found. A second important point to remember is that whenever a word has a variety of uses, by that I mean a wide semantic range, the particular meaning and author intended in any given context has to be determined from that context. I'm going to show you 13 different meanings of the word grace. It means favor, kindness, mercy, an act or exhibition of such favor, a state of being in someone's good or bad graces, thanks, a prayer at meals, virtue, a sense of right, title for royalty, they call them his grace or her grace, a temporary exemption or postponement. After all, when... Uh, IRS sends you, tell you you have grace now. You have a one month of grace. That doesn't mean unmerited favor. <laughs> and I don't want you to think that they have your kindness and mercy. It's <laughs> or that you're in their good grace. No, no. So attractiveness, charm, natural elegance. Save a woman, here's a woman with grace. And I've known men with grace. Divine power, a state of being in divine favor. A state of pleasing to God. An embellishment in music, that's that little bitty, looks like a 16th note above the treble cloth. Up there, it's a plink. But it's a grace note. You didn't know I knew that about music, did you? I was a good piano player. Would have been better if I played with both hands. <laughs> no one would think in their right mind that when I said, really, that the IRS really extended grace to me, that he's given me a musical embellishment note. Or when I received grace from in Infernal Revenue Service, that they were saying a prayer thanking me for postponing the filing of my tax return. <laughs> or that they were being elegant, posed, and charming in my presence. <laughs> like the Yiddish boy had married a Gentile girl. She took him home. And his dad owned, her dad owned about seven big farms. He took him downtown, around the courthouse, introduced him, all them businessmen. This is my new son-in-law, Hyman. When he comes in, just give him what he wants and I'll pay for it. And Hyman's eyes bug out every time. <laughs> Next morning, first thing he did when he got up, he was down at that bank at 9 o'clock. When it opened, he went in. The president saw him. He said, come in, Hyman, sit down. What can I do for you? Hyman says, I want some money. <laughs> Fine, how much you want? He says, how much you got? <laughs> <laughs> Why then, if we determine the meaning of the English word grace, which has at least 12 common uses for each context in which it is used, do we exist, insist that the Greek word charis, which also has a wide semantic range, means unmerited favor. Every place it is found regardless of the context. Lack of understanding concerning the nature of grace is the simplest answer and the one which has the most grace. Now, friends, when you begin to look into this, and you look into it in a very, very serious way. Now, Brother Gary said, I've been working on this for a couple of years. And the only man I didn't go to about this was a man I studied Greek under. And I want to tell you, it's the only compliment I ever had in studying Greek. He said, 
Khan. I never saw anybody ever learn the, Eng the Greek alphabet as quick as you did. Two or three years later, I wanted to look him up and say, Doc, you don't know anyone that ever forgot it so fast either. <laughs> Now, what I would call this is an expository reflection on grace from Ephesians. Now, let me say this. I have four friends, very, very, at least they think they're very good in Greek. And all these are a servant of the Lord somewhere. And all of them, I think, are underpaid. Now, I know many preachers that are overpaid. But I believe these, these four fellows are underpaid. But I'll tell you, I love those other two, but there's only two of them I could use of, of the time they worked on this with me and for me. And so I just never said a word to them about it. I, uh, one of them was severely handicapped and I thought it, uh, God uh, likes for you to be generous to the poor. He that giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. That which he has given, he will repay him again. You know, if any of the people in this world don't like me, it's preachers' wives. Now, I wouldn't tell you the main reason why. I'd run out of what little modesty I got. But I spoke in this big church, and this pastor, he followed me around like a little dog. When can you come and give me two weeks or however long you want? I said, well, you pray about it, and I'll pray about it. And my wife sat there, and his wife sat there like this. As if I wanted this church. I didn't want a church. I wouldn't touch that denomination with a 10-foot pole. By the way, you know I'm going to start a new company to make 10-foot poles? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody wants one. <laughs> that guy did everything he get to get me to come. But he never wrote me any letters. He never called me, and I never contacted him. I never had any man ever want me so badly as he did, I later went back to that town. I perhaps preached in that town 20 times. He'd tell his people to stay away from my meetings. Mm -hmm. The guy that wanted me so badly. Mm -hmm. But my wife had to explain it to me. She has to do that every once in a while with me. <laughs> I couldn't help it. That man never studied to, to, enough to make him eligible to cross a free bridge. Because you listen to him. All he did was give you emotion. That's not my fault. Why should his wife get mad at me over it? And I never said a word in there against emotions. In fact, as for these people that don't want any emotions, I tell them, I would to God he'd take it out of your married life, see how long that would last. But I do not believe in the end of a sermon to get men to try to weep and cry and become emotional, Finney would say, that man doesn't understand moral government of God that does that. You know that, brother. God doesn't want to. No cheap way like that. Uh-uh. Yet that's the main way many of them do it. All right, now, friends, this is going to be a very, very serious study, and maybe you won't like this, but it's like my book, Four Trojan Horses. I've had people say, hey, man, I ought to read that book with a dictionary right beside me. Let me say this to you, friends. Any book you can sit down and read once and thoroughly understand isn't worth reading. Amen. And any book that doesn't make you reach for a dictionary isn't going to do much for you either. I don't know why we're afraid of vocabularies. Yeah. So, I make no excuses. This is for a people that want to think, and it's thinkers that change the world, not feelers. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is theological rich with the nuances of salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, says Paul, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Salvation nuances find specific expression in the words like grace, save, faith, and so forth. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and more general expressions in a motif of reconciliation unfolded in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Tempting as it is to, to focus on a study of isolated salvation words, a trek taken by many interpreters, I shall not follow their path. The way is laden with exegetical pitfalls and conclusions drawn from such studies as potentially misleading. Too often, the close inspection of words blurs our views of context. C.S. Lewis, in his bleak against biblical critics like Boltmann, highlighted the irony of this misstep when he said, These men ask me to believe they can read between the lines of an old text. The evidence is their obvious inability to read in any sense worth describing the lines themselves. They claim to see fern seat and can't see an elephant 10 yards away in broad daylight. I have therefore chosen another road to discover the emphasis given to grace in Paul's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 by traveling through the broader training of Paul's thoughts in chapters 1 and 2. I take this approach because words lose all specificity apart from context. Context naturally limits a word's range of meanings. Unless we examine the context, we simply cannot know the difference between the grace we say at meals and the grace we extend to, ga- to guests, or the trunk of the car and the trunk of the tree. They're two different things, aren't they? Yet the word is the same. Context is the most single significant determiner of the meaning of the word or phrase. Now, by the way, that's quoted from William, Klein, Blomberg, Craig, and Hubbard from Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. So, it's not mine. And they go on to say, I am convinced that tracing the structure of the argument in the Pauline epistles is the most important step in the exegetical process. One of the weaknesses in many commentaries today is a failure to trace the argument in each paragraph, the failure to explain how each paragraph relates to the preceding and following paragraph. Instead, the commentaries focus on individual words and verses. Readers gain much knowledge about individual elements of the text, but they do not acquire an understanding of the argument or of each paragraph of the complete text. Expository reflection in any passage, therefore, must account for words as they occur in a given context. Consequently, the bulk of this paper gives special attention to the context of Ephesians 1 and 2, those two chapters. The broader sense surrounding this subject of grace, the centrality of Christ to the Baraka in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, the relation of grace to Christ's exaltation in the heavenly realm, the relation of grace to the believer's adoption of the Son, the relation of grace and man's redemption, finally, the nature of grace, and Augustine's interpretation of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. In the last section, I prefer to show what this passage suggests about salvation rebut the view built around the Augustinian interpretation of the passage that says... In initial faith in God is an irresistible grace, grace and not a personal response to divine grace. That's what this is going to go after. You get what I'm saying? The first chapter of Ephesians begins with the blessing and ends with the thanksgiving of Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. The blessing, a Christianized version of the Old Testament, Baraka is... One complete sentence in the Greek. A sentence of 202 words. Centering on the benefits received by the church through Christ. According to Dr. Gordon Fee, the, a friend of many of us in here, these opening words of the Baraka function as a kind of a subtitle for the entire letter as well as a topic sentence for the blessing in particular. 
The Jewish Baraka for blessed be God who has finds its earliest expression in Genesis in the words of Melchizedek, king of Salem, who upon Abraham's victory over the Chaldeemer and his allies blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed by God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Genesis 14, 19 through 20. A second instance occurs when Abraham's oldest servant, in search of a wife, finds Rebecca. Uh, Brother Dave, would you come up here and read? I got a very, very bad cramp. Yeah, could I sit there? All right. It's all right. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I'll sit there. I'll be all right. Oh. Yeah, here. Jewish Baraka. The Jewish Baraka, which means for blessed be God who has, finds its earliest expression in Genesis in the words of Melchizedek, king of Salem, upon whom, Ab- upon whom Abram's victory over uh, Chedorlaomer and his allies blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. A second instance occurs when Abram's oldest servant, in search of a wife for Isaac, finds Rebekah and prays, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Traditionally, the Berekah began as a spontaneous blessing to God for his special provision or deliverance and later became a form of blessing to God adopted by the Israelites in their corporate prayers and worship. Though rooted in the traditions of ancient Judaism, the Bereka of Ephesians 1 adds a distinctly Christian flavor to this blessing by centering it on what God has accomplished for His people through Christ and the Spirit. Christ is unmistakably central to the emphasis of this blessing. And Paul uses it, like the ancient Bereka, to acknowledge God's special provision and deliverance given to us in Christ. As commentator Andrew Lincoln says, the Christian focus of this particular blessing is hard to miss since in Christ and in Him is repeated in nearly every verse. Such repetition emphasizes that all that God has done for His people which issues in their praise has been done in Christ. Paul specifically outlines all that God has done for the church through Christ in the Bereka and seems intent to highlight two main points, that God's blessings come alike to both Jew and Gentile believers and that the blessings provided to the Ephesians through Christ are theirs in the heavenly realm. The phrase, in the heavenly realm, however, is subject to sundry interpretations and needs some explanation in order to understand how Christ's exaltation to this realm relates to grace. In keeping with the historical situation of the Asia Minor churches, the heavenly realm represented a place of magic and spirit powers. Both were understood to inhabit the heavenly places, Not surprising, therefore, Paul later says that the prince of the power of the air 
is the one who works in the sons of disobedience, and that's in chapter 2, 2, and describes the heavenly realm as the place in which principalities and powers dwell. Stott calls this the unseen world of spiritual reality, a realm inhabited by spiritual beings, both good and evil. The evil beings of this realm Paul calls principalities and powers. As Peter O'Brien observes, the New Testament teaches that principalities and powers are kinds of personal beings. This is obvious from the names that they bear. They are called gods, princes, and angels, while Satan is the prince of this world, the god of this world, the accuser, the adversary, the destroyer, etc. And from the nature of their opinions, operations, and activities. To speak of personal beings means that they manifest themselves as beings of intellect and will, which can speak and be spoken to. They are something which are capable of pur purposeful activity. In their rebellion against God, these forces exercise their independence and autonomy in self-centered opposition to God's moral government, aiming to undermine and thwart its purposes. Both the righteous and the wicked wrestle against these forces. Take Job, for instance. Remember the double accusation leveled against God's government when the adversary accused Job in the heavenly court? First, Satan accused Job for serving God from self-interest. He asked, does Job serve God for nothing? And secondly, accused God of winning Job's affection by granting him special favors. If you remove your blessing from Job, he will curse you to your face. Observe now the dilemma God faces. In order to prove Job's righteousness, he must now permit Job's suffering and temptation. If God intervenes to prevent, to prevent it, two evils result. Job's character is never rightly justified against the accusation of the enemy, and God's government is never fully justified against the accusation of bribery. Consequently, righteous Job suffers at the hand of the enemy. In the case of the wicked, however, the prince of the power of the air is said to work in their lives. This picture, given by Paul in Ephesians 2.2, portrays man's enslavement to the base appetites and desires of his nature aggravated and exaggerated by demonic influence. This is the manner of life from which the Ephesian church has been delivered. Not surprisingly, therefore, the focus of the Bereka celebrates the victory the Ephesian believers experienced from the domination of these influences. Once wicked men now yield themselves to a new Lord, a ruler seated in the heavenly realm. This exalted place symbolizes Christ's superiority, power, and victory over the unseen world as is evident in the lives of the Ephesian believers. As Peter O'Brien says, Christ's victory over Satan and the powers of darkness occurs preeminently in His death, resurrection, and exaltation. Though hostilities with principalities and powers continue, as is evident from Ephesians 6, 10-17, a firm allegiance to Christ ensures the believer's ultimate victory now and for the future. Again, to emphasize Paul, Paul's point, God is blessed for the impartial exercise for His mercy by including the Gentiles in the offer of salvation and by freeing them from the dominion of demonic influence and sin through Christ. Both of these acts properly express God's grace that is, his willingness and disposition to forgive and redeem. This sets the stage for Paul's first explicit mention of grace in the Bereka. In his Bereka, Paul blesses God because we've been predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to his good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which... He has made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have the redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, Ephesians 1, 5, and 6. According to Paul, God initiated our predestination to adoptions as sons. In turn, this resound, resounds to the praise of the glory of His grace. But what exactly does Paul mean? And how does grace relate to this adoption? In contrast to some Calvinist interpretations which suggest that God 
predetermined some to salvation, which is how they understand the phrase predestined to adoption as sons. In, uh, adoption as sons denotes the fulfillment of God's Old Testament promise of sonship to Israel. In Paul's view, sonship refers to a new relationship with God made possible through Christ, marked by participation in the Spirit, a relationship offered both to Greek, Jew, and Greek. In this relationship, Paul includes the Ephesians because the Ephesians, through, though Gentiles, knew Christ through the Spirit. They were considered adopted sons and participants in the blessings associated with sonship, a fact relevant because Gentiles are generally considered exempt from the blessings of God conferred on the Jews. The theological implications here are noteworthy. God did not adopt some men to salvation and hence predestined them. On the contrary, God offered all men a new relationship with Him, conditioned on repentance and faith, evidenced by presence of His indwelling Spirit, and all who entered into that relationship by choice adopted as sons. God determined beforehand or predestined this relationship to come to pass in the fullness of time. It was a relationship marked by the indwelling, empowering presence of God through His Spirit, a promise by the prophets and the Christ. As Herman Riverboss notes, it took effect when faith came, that is to say, when the new order and dispensation of salvation became effective, or, as it is said still more explicitly in Galatians 4.4 and following, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Sonship is therefore a gift of the great time of redemption that has drawn, dawned with Christ. It is the fulfillment of the promise that was given of the old to the true people of God, Romans 9, 26. This new relationship as adopted sons through the reception of the Spirit was evidenced, evidenced to the Gentiles that they were accepted in the Beloved. Their adoption as sons, their participation in the Spirit, and their acceptance with God through Christ all flowed from God's tender-hearted disposition toward them. The inclusion of the Gentiles in this promise is given as a grace or an exhibition of God's loving kindness. And so intensely does God favor believers with His grace that both their existence and their worship become a, a praise to the splendor of that grace. When God accomplished in His great undertaking, what God accomplished in His great undertaking to embrace mankind with His love and what He sacrificed to offer intimate acquaintance with Him now resounds in jubilant praise to God. Yet Paul does not stop with the grace demonstrated in their adoption, but continues to share of the abundance of grace demonstrated in their redemption. Nowhere does the abundance of God's grace ring clearer than the events surrounding man's redemption. In the next two verses, Ephesians 1, 7-8, Paul explicitly ties grace to the most costly event in mankind's history, the provision for forgiveness of sins through Christ's atonement. Paul says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. The reclamations of, of sinners does not come without great cost to God. The innocent Jesus suffered humiliation, ridicule, and crucifixion. Paul thus emphasizes redemption through his blood. No other way exists to reclaim mankind from the tyranny and bondage of their self-centered autonomy. Only the atonement of Christ solves the problems associated with the forgiveness of sins. Thus, Paul underscores three aspects of mankind's salvation the means of our salvation, or the atonement of Christ, the results of our salvation, or redemption in Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, and most importantly, the ground of the whole salvation plan, the riches of His grace. Whatever may be said about the glories of our redemption through Christ's atonement, apart from the merciful and loving disposition of God, the riches of His grace, all hope of salvation is gone. Thus, Paul emphasizes the extent of God's merciful love toward believers, both in the abundance of God's love for them and the generosity with which He bestows it. 
As Andrew Lincoln states, the term uh, sozo and righteousness with their connotations of abundance and extravagance helped to make this notion of grace emphatic while at the same time leaving the impression that words fail in attempting to describe the inexhaustible resources of God's giving. God's grace is evidenced both in His disposition and His design to save mankind. This clearly involves the exaltation of Christ to a place of acknowledged superiority over the forces of the unseen world as a sign of victory over the principalities and powers to whom they were enslaved. And God's impartial expression of salvation to the Gentiles by permitting them to share in the promises of Israel by adoption. Thus, in the Bereka, God's love initiates redemption, Christ's death affects it historically, and the Spirit appropriates it to the life of the believer and the believing community. These are all expressions of God's grace. In the next major section of one chapter, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, Paul follows this blessing with a thanksgiving for the Ephesians. The themes in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, while not specifically dealing with grace as such, together with the themes in Ephesians 2, 1 through 6, provide a theological backdrop for the ideas of grace later to surface in chapter 2. In a thanksgiving which evolves into a prayer, Paul asks for the Spirit to make God known to them and to reveal to them the rich benefits that are theirs in Christ. In fact, as Fee argues, the prayer is for God to grant them the Spirit, characterized here in terms of wisdom and revelation, through the Spirit's wisdom and revelation. Thus they will, one, come to have more thorough knowledge of God, and through the Spirit's enlightenment of their hearts will understand the certainty of their eschatological future, and God's power through the same Spirit in their behalf as they await that future. Paul's emphasis on the Spirit serves to underscore what God has done and is doing for them in Christ. Paul then highlights three areas of knowledge proffered by the Spirit. First, the hope of His calling. Second, the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saint. And third, the surpassing greatness of His power unto us who believe according to the working of His great might. Having experienced God's call to become His people, Paul prays that these believers might know the hope associated with that call, namely, the assurance that God will complete the work begun in them through the Spirit. In other words, Paul prays that as God's people, they will know the certainty of their promised inherit inheritance, their glorification, the word inheritance probably serves to underscore this future emphasis. Paul then moves from the certainty of the future to the reality of the present. The present spiritual conflict remains even though the future holds the ultimate pacification and submission of all principalities and powers to Christ. Consequently, Paul assures the Ephesians of the surpassing greatness of Christ's power given to them through the Spirit which prepares them to meet any spiritual battle with potential victory. He appeals to Christ's resurrection and exaltation as evidence for this claim. Jesus has not been removed from earthly influence by ascension, precisely the opposite. He has been moved to a place of ultimate influence over matters on earth. Thus, no powers or potentates in the world or in the heavens, whether good or evil, can compare his authority is the one at God's right hand is over all. Thus Paul concludes his prayer by saying that the Jesus who is given all power is given by God to the church which he fills. That of course means that the full authority and power invested in Jesus is at work in the church. Though these passages do not speak directly to the issue of grace, it is important to note their implicit relationship to it. Grace is introduced in Ephesians as God's kindest kindness exhibited to sinners in the death, resurrection, and exaltation of Christ. Highlighted in Christ's exaltation, grace, or God's divine influence through the Spirit, provides all that the believers need to overcome their bondage to past sin and demonic temptations. With this in mind, chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, flows directly from Paul's prayer in chapter 1, 15 to 23. 
Thus, Paul begins by reminding his readers of their past life of enslavement to sin and demonic influence and contrasts it with the present life given to them by God. Describing their past life, Paul says that they have walked first according to the course of this world and second according to the prince of the power of the air, who, says Paul, is the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. It is precisely this aspect of the Ephesian life that Paul wants to use as a contrast to the grace given to them in salvation. Consequently, some exposition of the past life seems in order. First, to walk in the course of this world means to yield oneself to the dominating influences of this evil age. Dr. Lincoln suggests that to live according to the course of this world thus becomes a way of talking about the spatial and temporal aspects of fallen human existence. Instead of being oriented to the life of the age to come in the heavenly realm, the past life of the readers has been dominated by this present evil age in this world. Their sinful activities are simply in line with the norms and values of a space-time complex wholly hostile to God. Second, to walk according to the prince of the power of the air introduces another dominant player in the human drama. While the influences of this world mainly stem from the moral agents and institutions of this world, influences of another sort fight for the allegiance of the Ephesian heart, a supernatural being hostile to redemptive purposes of God and human welfare, namely the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Although this phrase is subject to a number of interpretations, Lincoln seems to make the most sense of the text. He suggests that the personal power of the evil of evil is the ruler of the realm of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now at work in the disobedient. In other words, the prince of the power of the air rules over the spirit of every disobedient person and is the character of his government is evidenced in every disobedient act. Third, this realm of darkness is the domain in which the Ephesians once walked according to the semantic thinking. To live a certain life is to follow a given path. Paul uses the verb to walk more frequently in Ephesians than any other of his epistles. He learned to use it in rabbinical rather than a Greek, in Greek schools and always employed it as a metaphor, i.e., in the ethical sense which is foreign to Greek usage. Instead of denoting an aimless promenading or strolling along, in Paul and the Johannine epistles, the verb means a choice of steps in a given ground on a given ground in a given direction. Given these facts, it seems evident that the Ephesians' former manner of life originated in a choice to follow a path apart from God, a path which led to their enslavement. Paul calls this former manner of life the death in which they once lived. The Ephesians lived in a situation separated from God, a situation once common to Paul and all other believers. Thus Paul adds, we too were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The bulk of evangelical scholarship sides with the view that the nature here implies that which is acquired by birth and thereby associates this passage with the doctrine of original sin. Given that slant on the term nature, the interpretation of this passage strongly suggests that man from birth lies subject to God's judgment as, a ch as children of wrath on account of Adam's sin. Marcus Barth, in his commentary on Ephesians, makes a case for this interpretation from the context of Ephesians 2. But I see no reason why the context of Ephesians 2 will not bear the weight of another interpretation. In fact, if context is the sole arbiter, it seems likely that nature meaning a disposition of sinfulness acquired by one's own free will, would make a much, if not better, sense of the text. In either case, the end result is the same. Man, in his sinful condition, is a child of wrath, and thereby subject to the judgment of God. This describes the realm in which the Ephesians once walked. In contrast to their former manner of life, Paul now emphasizes their present situation with the words, but God, but God who is rich in mercy out of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses makes us alive together with Christ. Here Paul highlights the great initiative taken by God to free mankind from their slavery to sin 
and thus discloses to his readers what motivated God to extend himself in this way, his mercy and love. Paul then makes this parenthetical statement, by grace you have been saved. Again, as in chapter 1, Paul underscores God's disposition of love and mercy in association with the idea of grace. In fact, to emphasize the force of this point, Paul says God extended His love and mercy to the Ephesians even while they were living in complete opposition to Him. Upon what ground might we say salvation is offered? Ultimately, by the love and mercy of God. At least one of the conditions of salvation is also mentioned, faith. God is here willing to offer sinners an option they do not deserve. Salvation through Jesus Christ by grace, the ground of salvation, through faith, a condition of salvation. Grace is not, previously undis- is not a previously undisclosed attitude or characteristic of God, as if He had previously been known only as a wrathful deity, grace speaks of the holy, generous act of God which reflects the holy, generous nature of God. In this sense, grace is the readiness of God to exercise mercy and love to the undeserving by providing for their forgiveness of sins through Christ. But to again emphasize a theological point, the provision is offered on condition of repentance and faith. Again, as Paul advances his case in verses 6 and 7, we see grace mentioned in connection with Christ's exaltation, with raising believers to the heavenly realm and seating them there in Christ. Though subject to mystical interpretations, Paul had in view not some subjective religious experience on the part of believers, but rather thought of believers as having been Christ's partners in the events of past redemptive history. For him... Christ's death was a death to the old order, to the powers of this age, including sin, and His resurrection was a coming alive to a new order in which He functioned as Lord with the power of God. The new dominion into which believers have been, initiate, have been initiated is firmly anchored in history. The writer is under no illusion that sharing Christ's victory brings removal from the sphere of conflict. The rest of the letter provides ample evidence that those who have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies are at the same time those who must walk in the world and stand in the midst of the continuing battle with the powers. Notice the role free will plays for believers seated with Christ and yet living in the world from a parallel passage in Colossians. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things which are above. Here Paul speaks of our exaltation with Christ in terms of moral choices. Seek the things that are above and set your mind on things above. Paul further describes what it means to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated when he says, Put to death all that is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and put on compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness. Our exaltation with Christ, and that's the end. Are you feeling all right? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll finish there. Okay. There. That's all right. Yeah. According to my watch, we have about five minutes. Now, friends, I have a daughter. I have two daughters. I couldn't be more pleased with both of them. But the younger one, when she was 15 years of age, she could talk a bird out of a bush. When my wife and oldest daughter couldn't get something out of me, they'd get her to sick her after me and they thought they could get something. Well, at 15, she wanted a car very, very much. Now, as I said, God cannot have a way of forgiving sin that's going to hurt the man, but neither can he have a grace that's going to hurt man. So I told her, I said, Nancy, I'm going to give you a car. She, oh, daddy, that's wonderful. When? 
I said, well, now you listen. An automobile can be a very, very terrible instrument of death. I don't want to give you something you're going to kill yourself and kill other people with. And I'd be held accountable for it. So you got to show me that you're a very, very responsible person. And a good way to start that is you get on the honor roll. Now, I never was a person that ever, ever, ever talked about grades and grades and grades to my children. But I thought it very fitting here. I said, then you must have a driver's license. And I also knew you couldn't get one until you're 16. So you must show me that you're responsible and you could know how to handle this car and that you're going to be on the honor roll and you are on the honor roll and then I'm going to give you a car. So within the next six months, she became 16. She got a driver's license. She took the necessary training to do that. She showed me that she's the kind of a girl she should be. And you know, I gave her a car. Now, not a brand new one. It was about $3,500. I gave it to her. Now, she met the conditions, and that car was strictly grace. She couldn't earn that. $3,500. But there were conditions for this. You see what I'm saying? And repentance and faith is one of them. Now, the reason I, I've been on this so much, my oldest daughter is quite a speaker. And I mean among women. She's, people that heard her and think she's the finest in the country, my oldest daughter. And she's very, very shy like her daddy. <laughs> But the point that I, I want to bring out here is I gave her a car also, but she also passed the same test. I could not give her something that's going to destroy her and destroy other people. Very, very serious thing. Well, I want you to know that Christ does not cast his pearls before swine. And he tells us to count the cost before we ever come to him. Now, this oldest daughter has a friend that her husband is a graduate of Moody and Trinity Seminary and was a youth pastor up until about uh, two or three months ago. He's resigned. He's teaching out Moody. But his wife was forever telling my daughter, and they're good friends, yes, Faithy, if you do anything but believe, that's works. Well, now I'm going to quote you Ephesians 5, 14. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See, they got that silly thing from St. Augustine that man is dead, so therefore he can't repent, he can't do that. But Augustine didn't seem to differentiate between physical death and spiritual death. So spiritual death doesn't mean that you're totally impotent, doesn't mean... And Paul there, and you'll find that's in the imperative mood, he demands that we awake to righteousness and sin not. And by the way, you can find those in other places too. Wake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. The spiritually dead can what? They can hear, they can reason, they can choose, they can repent. If those aren't conditions for grace, then you tell me what they are then words don't mean much to me. And so, you will find that there are conditions to grace, but nowadays, we don't tell people to count the cost. I often say we preach like used car salesmen. Don't kick that tire, the wheel, the wheel fall off. And like when the rich young wheeler came to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus began probing his heart for his idol. Everybody's got a God sitting on the heart of the throne. And he started probing and he found out what it was. It was his money, wasn't it? Well, he said, all right, now, if you want this, go sell what you have. 
come follow me. Jesus had conditions. I think if we're going to follow him, we ought to have conditions just like he has, and I think when we do, we'll get the kind of results he did from his preaching. But there are, make no mistake about it, there's conditions of grace just like my daughter had to have it. And I wouldn't have been a decent and a good daddy to her if I'd have just given it which could kill her and kill other people and be totally irresponsible. I'd be a party to it, wouldn't I? Well, God's got a gospel. It's the most wonderful thing in all the world. But us don't sell it cheap. So, Brother Gary, would you dismiss us, please? Just a moment, I, I, I meant to say something there and I didn't. In Acts 9, Jesus appears to Paul out there on the, on the road to Damascus. He strikes him blind and a great light and he says, who art thou? And he says, oh, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now he says, Paul, I want you to go to Damascus, keep on right on going to Damascus and you'll find in there a fellow named um, Ananias, who will tell you what you must do to be saved. Now, who says if you do anything other than believe, it's works? If Jesus says there's things you've got to do, then we got to do them, regardless of what Moody Bible Institute says. You get my point? Then, two other places, but the third one is in the 26th verse. He says, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. This is no irresistible grace. I was not disobedient, which is plainly inferring and implying he could have been. In the kingdom of God, there's no shotgun marriages. Thank you. I couldn't find it on your back. <laughs> At this particular time in our uh, conference, what we like to do is give individuals an opportunity to share with us what other things are going on in the realm of ministry and in moral government. And so uh, we have a uh, uh, number of people that would like to share with us and of course, EEM will take their turn also at sharing what's happening with us at this particular time. So I believe that what we'll do to begin with is to ask our brother Dean Harvey, who is our editor of Notes and Quotes, to come up and share with you where we are on Notes and Quotes. Uh, of course, last year when we talked about it, we were, uh, uh, doing a little struggling at that time, but uh, I believe things are uh, looking a little better, but I'd like to have our brother Dean come up and, and share with you what's going on in EEM right now. Dean, uh, we'll just leave that mic there, so okay. stay behind the, the uh... okay. Well, I don't know a whole lot that I can add other than uh, those of you who read the notes and quotes glean from the letters from the editor where I try to keep you up to date, you know, from issue to issue. We, we try to put a notes and quotes out every two months. 
But this year we've put out four when we should have put out five. We'll try to put out one more about the end of November. Uh, last year our problem was finances. This year the Revival Theology Promotion people, Jeff, Paul, and Minneapolis have donated, I think it's $2,000 to us to help. And we managed to cut the cost of an issue down from about $1,800 to just over 1000 So we've been doing a little bit of homework there too. Uh, one of the things that we intend the notes and quotes to be is kind of a communication vehicle or instrument by which we can network various ministries. Of course, we want it to teach. Uh, we want it to have solid information in it as well as just a networking type ministry. Uh, in this last issue, I wanted to publish a... Uh, an article by a fellow from California, and it was pretty technical, pretty theological, and so I gave it to Mark to read, and Mark says, I don't think we ought to publish it. So we says, okay, we'll let Gary read it. These guys are kind of my editorial board, and Gary came back and he says, I agree with Mark. We are. <laughs> so we didn't publish it. But Gary came up with a good idea. Sometime after the first of the year, we're going to try to publish a theological journal. And we're going to include this. And then there's another article that we, uh, that I've already got in my mind that we'd like to publish. And it will be, you know, more theological, more technical. And so if you want to send anything to be published in notes and quotes, let me tell you what you have to do. <clears throat> After the first of the year, I'm hoping to upgrade our computer. But right now... We're on WordPerfect 5.1. So if you send me something on WordPerfect 6.0, I can't use it. I might be able to find somebody who can convert it for me. But please just don't send me 12 and 14 page manuscripts that either my secretary or I have to retype. Please don't do that. If you're going to go to the trouble to write a paper that you'd like to see published in notes and quotes, please send me a disk on WordPerfect 5.1. Okay? That's very important. And that will help us to use it more easily. Uh, <clears throat> Mark, how many, how much material do you send out, say, the last month or two? Either, either books, tapes, or some combination. Right. As far as how much material, it's hard to say. Some people just want one tape. Other people want everything we've got sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, sometimes I'm sending out a box, and sometimes just a small envelope. But um, I'm constantly uh, having to call for Bible theology promotion and Jed Smock and other folks where we get some of our materials from and reorder. That's, you know, one of our biggest... One other thing I need to remind you, it would be wonderful if you have people who are interested in what we're doing. I'm talking about seriously interested. You need to send us their names so we can put them on our mailing list. Because we want to try to keep our mailing list updated. Another thing that happens to us is we always put return uh, address correction re requested in. So we get, I don't know, 50 or 60 notes and quotes back every issue of people who have changed addresses. And so as much as possible, we'd like you, if you move and you're interested in the notes and quotes, please keep us updated on that particular, you know, on your address. Uh, let me just say one other thing from a personal standpoint. 
You know, I'm the editor of Notes and Quotes. You might think that's some kind of a great, big, glamorous job. That's not. It's a whole lot of hard work. And uh, I've got plenty to do without having this extra job. I don't get paid anything for it. They offered to pay me, but I don't want to be paid. This is a ministry that I love because I feel like this message is the vehicle for revival. And anything that we can do to get this message out, I'm for 100%. But sometimes when we're a little bit late on an issue of the notes and quotes, it's because I don't have enough time to get it out. And uh, so, you know, I could use your prayers and you've got things to publish. Well, that'd be great. But if you send something in to be published, I can't guarantee it'll be published. You know, some people have wonderful hearts and they're good students, but they're rotten writers. Sometimes people send me good stuff and I think, you know, if I had time to rewrite that, it'd be great. I just don't have time, at least so far. So uh, that, that's just one of my little dilemmas. God seems to have given me a gift for being clear and concise and being able to bring order out of chaos and some of the things that people write. So praise the Lord. Now, Dave Koch wanted me to make a, to add to this a little bit of a presentation about uh, uh, Brother Olson's ministry. What's it called? BRF, Bible Research Fellowship. We are putting, or they are putting, I'm on the board there too, so I guess I could say we are putting uh, approximately 200 titles out of Brother Gordon Olson's library on a CD that we hope is out soon after the first of the year. We have not decided yet on the price that we're going to charge for that CD. But in order to use it, you have to have a computer with a CD. But uh, we're going to try to get it out for a reasonable cost. But when you stop and look at Brother Gordon's library and take 200 volumes out of that library, you know, even two or three hundred dollars would be a wonderful price to pay for a serious student. We're going to try to get it for less than that. So that'll be out sometime after the first of the year, right, Dave? We think January. And as soon as it comes out, we'll have an announcement in notes and quotes with the address and how to get it and how much it is, all that kind of thing. Are there any questions anybody has for me? Can't even remember. Yeah. Wonderful so, series. You can't remember. Carnal, carnal Christians. That's absolutely <laughs> fabulous. And, you know, on these sheets we've got out here where it says if you have a request, if, if you would like it, it's just, uh, so far it's just two tapes, right? Three. Was it three? And some of this He stuff missed one. Is, that's right, three. Some of this stuff is stuff that goes on at our church, but between Chapelwood and EEM, we have the wonderful ability to, you know, each of us to benefit from this material. So if you have a subject matter that you're interested in, just write to us and ask us what we've got. We might have something that isn't in the catalog, so we're trying to say, and we're going to try to update that soon. Okay. Mark, what's our telephone number there at your desk? 962-8369. One other thing. <clears throat> this is the EM's number, by the way. One other thing for the last... Oh, four or five years since I've had this job. One of our problems is that we haven't had enough money. I guess that's everybody's problem all the time. And so I have consistently asked the people at this conference, please try to make a monthly commitment of $25 a month to EEM. 
If we could have, you know, we've got somewhere around 30 people at the most, I think, that have ever done that. But if we could have 100 people doing that, it's no telling what we could do. And so I just would like to ask you, if you're not making a monthly commitment to EEM of $25 a month and you are committed to this message, then I'd like to ask you to do it. God bless you. By the way, uh, Ted Elliott, myself, Mark, Dean, Harry, uh, any one of us, uh, you can come and contact us for anything about EEM. Uh, any one of us should be able to answer any of their questions. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, call upon Lori uh, Snyder to come up. And uh, uh, Lori's dad, many of you know, is Alan Snyder. He's uh, teaching at the Graduate School at Regency College in Virginia Beach, Virginia. He was unable to be here with us uh, this year, so uh, she's going to uh, talk about her dad's book. Just very briefly, um, this is his book, The Foundations Are Destroyed, and he wanted to be here at this conference, but he can't, so he asked me to just make this book available, and it's $10. If you want to um, write out a check or something, make it, to, make it out to Principal Press, and just hand it to me, and I can get it to him probably pretty soon in the mail. Or whatever. Just, it's um, a wonderful book. It's yeah. it's very good. I I, I can. I read it. it twice already. Like Harry says, if you want to learn, the first time through was fun. The second time through, I learned something. It's a good book. I've I've been in some of his classes where he's taught the principles in this book, and they were just really good classes. You learn a lot about what this book is basically about: is um, biblical principles and civil government as it relates to our country's government and things. Also, if you want to. Maybe just wait a while and order it later. We have these um, brochures with order forms in it and stuff like that. So everything you need is right out there on the table. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Jerry? Yes. Can I mention what uh, Dr. Snyder teaches on campuses and how this book would be just well, that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the things that he's teaching now on campus uh, does relate uh, to the book. Um, on uh, Christianity and uh, uh, government. Uh, he tried to do a lot of uh, teaching on moral government at the Christian college he was at before, and uh, they really didn't like it on a Christian college. Uh, but uh, I believe that Alan uh, uh, has great liberty right now in teaching, and it's all based on Moral Government Foundation and uh, at Regency College. And uh, last time I talked to him on, pardon? Regency University. Regent. The last uh, time I talked to him, he was just uh, really having a ball uh, doing what he's wanted to do before where he was held down. So it's a, it is an excellent, excellent book. Uh, at this time, I'd like to have uh, John, I believe it is, come up and talk to us about uh, Destiny Ministry. For those of you that don't know me, I'm John Moore, and I'm with Destiny Ministries in Frankfort, Kentucky. We're the ones doing the, uh, the video in here. And uh, Before I start talking about us, one of the things that, uh, that I do want to say is, is that uh, earlier you guys talked, what, 21 years ago you, you started this, and uh, I think about five years ago we came up for our first conference, and I remember when we first came here how excited we were that, that there were other people out there in the world that thought the way we thought. And because we thought we were some of the few, I guess maybe we still are some of the few, but I know there have been sacrifices. Those, those of you over the years that have, have, have uh, organized EEM and, and, and the ministries around that. So I just want you to know how thankful that I am that there's a place like this that we can come and share together and, 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 and really feel edified and, and uh, the guide is, uh, is really in this and not something we'd be ashamed of. But uh, I just want to thank you guys for having this. And uh, we're so thankful to be able to video this, to offer these kind of truths. When, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Agape Force. Did you ever hear of Agape Force? Okay. Uh, some of the guys from Agape Force came to Frankfort, Kentucky. And Frankfort's the capital of Kentucky and started a church there and, uh, and started it in my basement. Uh, and for a year and a half, I learned a lot of things about God that I'd never heard of before because they weren't taught in the churches. 
And uh, after they left through the problems in that particular ministry, but they left, all that was left of that were teaching tapes, video <laughs> teaching tapes. And uh, for a few years, that's all I had there. And I, and I knew how important that was to me, the videotape. So, so when the Lord spoke to us later about doing things in ministry, uh, we're excited to be able to produce videotapes that have truths of so many good teachers uh, and, and make those available to you that you can make available to other people because those tapes can be around 15, 20 years from now. We've got tapes of Winky Prattney that's got ties on this wife. <laughs> but the truths are still the same. The truths are still the same. It really is. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone over many tapes and just rewound them and, and watched and took notes and scriptures and things like that. And it's just, it's just real exciting. Some of the things I want to share with you that we're doing at, uh, at Destiny Ministries, beside the tapes, uh, we have a vision one of these days to have some type of a discipleship school. We would love to have something like that in the Frankfurt area and, uh, and hope that we can. But also, we're doing a radio show right now uh, that's on a secular radio station, and it is a call-and talk radio show. I was involved in state government uh, for a while there, for about 10 years in, in Frankfurt, and uh, long story short, was asked to do some things that weren't right and, and uh, couldn't get those people to stop doing the things that were wrong, so we had to start an investigation. And out of the investigation, uh, a, a constitutional officer was convicted of a felony and sent to prison. Well, during that time, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, grief that we had to put up with. Uh, it was, uh, we, we did what we did under what they call the whistleblower law. It was the first time in Kentucky that it was ever, uh, ever tested in court. So my case was the test case. Well, out of that, we got a lot of publicity. It was on TV shows and, and uh, newspapers. And uh, not everything that said about us was very nice because a lot of politicians were saying it. But because of that, a lot of the small people, small employees, things like that trusted us because we were crazy enough to, to stick our neck out and, and, and do those things. So now with a radio show, people trust us and listen to us. So we have a radio show in the capital city that is widely listened to by the employees of state government. We've got between 30 and 40,000 employees in state government and uh, have had the opportunity to share moral government principles. Uh, sometimes we talk religiously. We'll talk scripture and about the Lord and things like that. Other times we just simply talk principles. We've had uh, a good effect. We had the Attorney General for the state of Kentucky call us and threaten us. And uh, yes, that means you were doing something right. And the neat thing is after doing a number of shows about the corruption that was there, he ended up calling us, wanted to have lunch with us, so we have lunch with him, and he comes on the show shortly thereafter. And uh, after that, he, he had enough nerve to at least set himself up where when the phone calls come in, he would answer all the questions. He didn't necessarily answer them all right, but at least he had the intestinal fortitude to do it. But since then, we're also working with the FBI in, in Kentucky, and, and they are, uh, uh, have supported us in the uh, beginning of a show called Kentucky's Most Wanted from a, from a secular standpoint. And if we can get some cooperate, cooperation with cooperations, then uh, we're, we're going to uh, uh, produce a, a statewide show that will, will uh, be much like America's Most Wanted, but will be Kentucky's Most Wanted. But beside the FBI doing backing us on that, the Attorney General themselves have, have endorsed us. Because of what we did, they at least respect us, and we didn't cave in to them. And I think rather than, than fight us, they decided to simply uh, to, to endorse us. But, so that's some of the things that we're doing there. Uh, something else you guys can, can think of there that, uh, that we need to share? Sal? Give us some information on uh, about the tapes and how they can get them and, and uh, some of that so they can... Okay, one of the things that we do on the tapes, uh, we've been influenced by a lot of different ministries that uh, are doing things for the Lord. And, and our philosophy is, is obviously to get the information that's in the tapes, the teachings out. And we're asking a $20 price on each one of the tapes, but there's a condition on that too, or whatever you can afford. If you can only afford $5 and you really genuinely want that one of those tapes, please, we'll, we'll be more than happy to take $5. Or if you don't have any money at all, we'll be more than happy to give you a tape that, 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 that you need. So uh, I guess uh, Keith Green of Last Day's Ministry really, really spoke to me a lot about his heart for God and that he was willing to do that. 
And uh, so when we decided to start doing things, we wanted to do it the same way. And I, I know that the, you guys with EEM also do the same thing. So the uh, teaching tapes are $20 a piece. The uh, debate on Calvinism, which we had last July, uh, is $75. It's a four-tape set. Uh, it's an incredible set to, to, to watch. Uh, it's one thing for us to sit here and talk about what Calvinists believe and to hear us say it. But it's another thing to hear a, a guy stand up and say that's what he believes, and to say that and much more, right, Jed? I mean, and, and Jed did an incredible job, did an incredible job with, with that. And uh, uh, we went on campus also in video Jed, and he's got a video. You guys, if, if, if you have, if every one of you here should buy at least one copy of Jed's video from Jed. Uh, tremendous, tremendous things that, that, that happened on that tape. And, what we saw there was the people on college campuses, the Christians, professing Christians, the atheists, the fill in the blank, all were hiding behind the same place. And they're hiding places that were established by the church and by uh, Calvinism, basically. And uh, I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe they were all having the same arguments. So therefore, after we did uh, video Jed's tape to, to start making his tape, then we decided to do the conference on the debate, and uh, if you don't have uh, both Jed's tape and also the, the debates, then I, I would urge you to do so. And uh, if we sell out of some here, uh, you can contact us uh, directly. Or you can get our name and number through EEM or through us, whatever. But uh, but we would appreciate also appreciate your prayers. Uh, I've got to tell you a little bit on, on a personal basis here. I am extremely blessed to have people working with me uh, like Keith and Bobby. Uh, they're young guys, younger than I am. And uh, uh, Bobby is my son-in-law, married to my daughter, Destiny, whom after our, our, the ministry is named. But uh, to see young men uh, giving their whole heart to God, and in spite of obstacles that are there, lack of finances, to press forward and know that not turning to the right or not turning to the left. That's real encouragement for me, and, 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 and I am blessed to be associated with, with, with two guys like that, as well as uh, you guys here at EEM. So, uh, any questions? I want to make a comment. Bobby, I want you to stand up. <laughs> John's daughter's name is Destiny. And Bobby met her on a blind date. How'd you guys like to go on a blind date with a girl named Destiny? <laughs> <laughs> you notice we didn't call her predestiny. <laughs> we have a, uh, a, a basically a rough draft over there. I think we have some left of, of a catalog. There's about 20 or 21 of those. Oh, one other thing, too. We have a book, Crystal Christianity, that we've had the opportunity to, to buy several hundred of these. And uh, if, if some of you have not read this book, please take one free from us. And uh, if we, I'm assuming we have enough left now to give away free. We brought 50 with us this time. But if you don't, call us, write us, and we'll send you one free. And uh, if we have more, take more to give those, these things away. Uh, Ken, are you here? Where? My roommate. There you are. Okay, uh, you want to share a second, just 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 what 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 happened uh, since what June or when was it with this this book? Oh, that was in April. April. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll be coming up. Are you okay? I'll good. Be, good. Any other questions? See that campus ministry video that you talked about.
Yes. There's a scene of some of the professing Christians on campus joining hands with these sodomites to pray against us. Yes, wow. absolutely. It's amazing how bold these uh, professing Christians will get, not to oppose sin and blasphemy, but to oppose the, the creature creatures of righteousness. So there's uh, about two and a half uh, hours of uh, video and Ninety-nine percent of it's from from University of Kentucky. It was just a small part that we shot at Eastern Kentucky uh, with Jeff. It's a very good video, though. I have the video. I give it to my friends. Hopefully, they like them too. Well, I I didn't consider myself to be naive, but when I went on campus for two days with Jed, I was saying, "Wow, I, you know." And this is the, the, the American dream. Let's have our kids grow up and go to college. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not. Let's say one other recommendation for it. A lot, a lot of you have heard me preach, but you never had the privilege of hearing my wife preach. If you <laughs> like my preaching, uh, you might like hers even better. Yeah. So. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. So, yeah, my children too are on there. <laughs> By the way, uh, there's uh, some people, no, I'm done. there's some people out in this world that believe that if you agree with a sinner, you're guilty of that same sin. Does that sound reasonable? If I agree with someone that's sinning, then I am guilty of that same right. sin. See? So one of the real problems that, they can, that, uh, that happens is when Christians gather hands with this type of people and are agreeing with them against the word of God, they're committing the very same sin as that person they're agreeing with. And that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous in some of the churches that we go to. We go and we sit in, these, we go and sit in churches knowing very well that people believe the way they believe and agree with sinners out there. If we do that, the danger is we become what those sinners are. That's dangerous. I couldn't sit in a church like that. I couldn't sit in a church that believes we sin in word, thought, and deed every day. I could not sit in a church that believes that. You know why? Because then I'm agreeing with them by staying there and becoming part of their group. I'll never change them. The only person that will be changed is me. Because their doctrine is set. So much for that. Yeah. One other thing. Yeah. Jed was on the, the Eastern Kentucky University campus. There was a gentleman there from one of the Christian organizations on the athletic system or something like that. Whatever. <coughs> he was one of the main debaters with Jed in front of the students. Finally, he turned around to us about 400 students there and said, you know, we have no part with sin. You know, we're, not, we're not like sin. We're not with sin. And I thought, Ooh. Very dangerous, well, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, by the way, uh, Brother Jed Smock will be the uh, main speaker at our Flint Conference uh, in April 1996, April the 18th, 19th, and 20th. And uh, Jed will be uh, the main speaker there. He'll be speaking at least four times. And uh, uh, Brother Harry has consented, of course, to come. By the way, you realize that this is 21 years that we've held conferences sometimes as many as four a year, and Harry has never missed one. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. To me, that shows a commitment to the ministry. That's number one. Of course, he's been very supportive in many other ways, but it, uh, that's great. But uh, remember, Brother Jed will be up in Michigan, and uh, there'll be more information in the uh, notes and quotes uh, about that. Uh, in fact, probably the next notes and quotes that comes out, we'll have it in there. Where would Dean go? Oh, he just left. So, yeah, we will have that information early enough so you can start making plans. I don't even know that Dean knows uh, all of this information yet, but it's just come together here in uh, the last little bit. Uh, we still got 15 minutes before lunch, so I'd like to have Jim Gillis come up and uh, talk to us. We, we will get all the ministries in before the day's over. If we don't get them all now, we will get them in. So.
Thank you very much for having me speak behind the pulpit here. I don't know a whole lot of you, and you don't know me, so I'll start from the very beginning of how I got saved in November the 7th, 1980, 15 years ago. It was at 